Now we move to the um, last but not least presentation of this module. Um, Professor Jean-Louis Teboul from Bicetre Paris, um, again, a world expert in the uh, hemodynamic domain. Um, and Dr. Uh, Professor Jean-Louis Teboul will discuss with us troubleshooting and basically it will be some discussion on how to deal with some very difficult topics and issues like atrial fibrillation and so on. So, Professor Jean-Louis Teboul. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. First of all, I would like to thank the Open Society of Intensive Medicine for this invitation to participate in this uh, program. And I will first present my conflicts of interest for this presentation. And second, I, I want to uh, present the objectives of this uh, uh, talk, uh, which is, which are to to give practical guidance to most common hemodynamic problems in ICU, onset tachyarrhythmias, low flow states, oliguria despite free challenges, and refractory hypotension. First of all, onset of tachyarrhythmias, and I will concentrate on atrial fibrillation, which is the most frequent arrhythmia observed in the ICU. This is a typical tracing of atrial fibrillation. This was recorded just uh, three, days ago, three days ago in our ICU. And as you can observe, the heart rate is irregular with no atrial contraction. And the heart rate is very high here, 168. And it is associated with a low blood pressure and especially a low pulse pressure meaning a low stroke volume, and we are not surprised by the low stroke volume in this particular situation. So, uh, some words about atrial fibrillation, and I will concentrate on new onset atrial fibrillation, AF. Atrial fibrillation and new onset are frequent in ICU patients, including septic patients, and this even without history of atrial fibrillation. This is a recent study looking at uh, ICU population, general population of ICU patients, uh, more than 1,800 uh, uh, patients, and new onset atrial fibrillation was observed in 12% of the population. Recurrent atrial fibrillation was observed in 7%. Recurrent is patient with history of atrial fibrillation, and with new episode during the ICU stay. And 81% of patients had no atrial fibrillation at all. There are many precipitating factors which can uh, uh, result in new onset atrial fibrillation. And these factors are well summarized in this recent paper published in Intensive Care Medicine we have some predisposing factors, older age, uh, history of atrial fibrillation, of course, diabetes, hypertension, et cetera, obesity, and also precipitating factors. We have, we have condition related, and I would like to, to insist on electrolyte disturbances, for example, hypokaliemia, also hypomagnesemia, and of course, hypovolemia, and sometimes hypervolemia. And in my experience, and probably the experience of many intensivists, hypovolemia is a very important precipitating factor, and correction of hypovolemia sometimes can, can fix a problem. Shock also and sepsis, infection, but also inflammation are precipitating factors. And we also have some precipitating factors which are related to treatment. For example, the use of vasopressors, and we emphasize on the use of uh, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, but also inotropes like uh, dobutamine are some uh, precipitating factors uh, leading to uh, new onset of uh, atrial fibrillation. This can uh, occur at any time and mostly in the first days. For example, this is a study I already uh, talked about showing that new onset atrial fibrillation generally occurs on the first day and sometimes uh, 
the second day or the third day, but not later. This is the same for recurrent atrial fibrillation. It is uh, meaning episodes of atrial fibrillation in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation. Of course, a new onset atrial fibrillation may worsen the hemodynamic condition and essentially resulting in low calic output, in a reduction in calic output due to the loss of the atrial systole during the left ventricular feeding, but also reduced diastolic time due to tachycardia. And of course, new onset atrial fibrillation is associated with increased risk of stroke, ischemic stroke, uh, due to uh, the clot, which, is, uh, which can be uh, uh, moved in the circulation to the brain and increase mortality. And this is uh, a study I spoke about before, showing that mortality, sorry, mortality uh, was higher in hospital, mortality was higher in patients with new onset atrial fibrillation, 47% here, compared to recurrent atrial fibrillation in patients with uh, history of chronic uh, atrial fibrillation, and also compared to patients with no atrial fibrillation. And when uh, the uh, uh, episode, the, 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 all the three factors were adjusted, uh, taking into account the co-variables, co-founding factors, still new onset atrial fibrillation was associated with higher mortality compared to no atrial fibrillation or to recurrent atrial fibrillation. So in terms of practical uh, uh, strategy, if we have, we have to distinguish two situations, very poor hemodynamic tolerance and no poor hemodynamic tolerance. In case of, in case of very poor hemodynamic tolerance, we should consider electrical cardioversion. In case of no poor hemodynamic tolerance, we have first to try to correct electrolyte disturbances, for example, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and also we, we have to test fluid responsiveness and correct potential hypovolemia. And also we have to consider reducing beta agonist agents and the doses or replacing these agents by no uh, non-adrenergic drugs. If atrial fibrillation persists in spite of these measures, we can have two possibilities. Either to select rhythm control, which is like a pharmacological cardioversion, and we can use either or combination of IV magnesium and this sulfate of magnesium, and this in spite of documented hypomagnesemia and high dose of imiodarin. And of course, we have to check LVF before uh, because we cannot use a very high dose in patients with a very poor LV contractility. This is a possibility. Another possibility is to have a rate control strategy, uh, not trying to, to, to restore uh, sinus rhythm, but to decrease tachycardia, to decrease heart rate. And this can be done by, again, IV magnesium and lower dose, not low dose, but lower dose of amiodarin, darin, and also can be uh, done by beta blockers. A, uh, fast, um, uh, how to say, uh, fast uh, half-life beta broker like Esmolol or maybe Langerol, which is a new one. And there are some new papers about the effects of Langerol on uh, tachyarrhythmias in ICU patients, and especially in patients with sepsis. It is important, I think, to restore, to restore sinus rhythm as soon as possible. This is a study showing that in patients with no restoration of sinus rhythm, we have a mortality of 61% compared to 26 in patients with restoration of sinus rhythm. Uh, 
and this compared to 17% in patients with no atrial fibrillation. Of course, we have to think about uh, giving anticoagulation. And this is a debated topic. Uh, of course, we have to prevent ischemic stroke, and this is why anticoagulation is very important. But as you know, we are in the ICU with very, very uh, severe patients with high risk of bleeding. And so we have to balance the risk of bleeding and the benefit which can be the prevention of ischemic stroke. And there is no recommendation in ICU patients. This is a, a study published in the JAMA Cardiology some years ago, and including many patients, more than 38,000 patients with sepsis and atrial fibrillation, and with no alternative indication for anticoagulation. And the authors separated the population in two groups, a group of 24,000 patients, or almost 25,000 patients, receiving no, who received no anticoagulation, and a group of uh, uh, 13,000 uh, patients who received in IV or subcutaneous anticoagulation. And interestingly, uh, there was no benefit in this study of giving anticoagulation because the risk of bleeding was higher in patients who received anti anticoagulation compared to patients who did not, but the benefit was not a very obvious reduction of the risk of ischemic stroke, 1.3% in patients who received anticoagulants compared to 1.4% who patients who did not receive anticoagulants, and this difference was not significant. So there is no uh, recommendation to systematically give anticoagulants in this situation of uh, new onset atrial fibrillation. What about low flow states? Many things were already said by Professor Price and Professor Vincent, of course. So I will very, I will be very quick. And we have, as you know, uh, four categories of shock. This is a paper by Jean-Louis Vincent and Daniel Debacker and distributive shock, hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, obstructive shock, and the majority of shock in ICU patients uh, uh, are distributive and mostly septic shock, but sometimes, of course, we have the other categories, and these other categories are associated with low flow state, low calic output. And I think that we can, uh, we can have a very uh, simple uh, decision tree for patients with acute secondary failure. And here is to try to identify low flow state because we can, if we identify low flow state, we can have uh, immediate treatment, which is increasing calic output. If we have no low flow state in shock, it is more difficult. So how to identify low flow state by clinical signs Mottling increased capillary field time. And it is interesting that if you have mottling and uh, increased capillary field time, it is, this situation is frequently associated with low calic output. This is a study showing measuring calic output and looking at the presence of these skin perfusion markers. And as you can observe, it's, the presence of these markers is very specific of low calic output. But the absence of these markers is not an indicator of uh, normal or high calic output. So the absence of molting or increased capillary time does not exclude low calic output. In addition, we can look at pulse pressure, the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pre pressure. As you know, pulse pressure depends on stroke volume and aortic stiffness. And therefore, a low pulse pressure around 30, 40 meters of mercury suggests that the stroke volume is low. So it's very simple to do at the bedside. And just at a glance, you can identify patients with low stroke volume and therefore a low flow state. But a normal or high pulse pressure, more than 40 meters of mercury, does not exclude a low stroke volume in cases of stiff arteries. 
and this is very frequent in our ICUs. So, modeling, increased calcarifrage time, but also low pulse pressure are good indicators of low calc output, but also low SCV2, if you can measure SCV2 using a central venous line, and low velocity time integral, if you can measure using echocardiography, and low VTI is a marker of low stroke volume. Okay, if you confirm or if you have a high suspicion of low flow state, try to distinguish between hypovolemia and cardiac dysfunction. In favor of hypovolemia, overt feed losses, of course, clinical context, for example, sepsis at the early phase is always associated with hypovolemia, and positive pre responsiveness test. So, in present of this uh, clinical uh, context, or test or signs, you have to consider fluid balance. In favor of cardiac dysfunction, clinical context, of course, negative preload responsiveness test if you perform tests, and of course, cardiac dysfunction at echocardiography. But sometimes, and you have to consider inotropes, especially dobutamine in this situation. But sometimes it's difficult to diagnose. Uh, hypovolemia or cardiac dysfunction because you have sometimes comorbidities or combination of uh, different uh, components of shock or associated ARDS in addition to shock. In these conditions, you have to think about uh, an advanced hemodynamic monitoring device. And this is recommended by the the ESICM in this consensus paper published some years ago, in, we said in complex patients, we suggest to additionally use PA catheter or transparent thermodilution device to determine the type of shock. And if we have no response to feed balance or no response to inotropes, it is another, another indication of advanced hemodynamic monitoring devices. And in this consensus paper with Daniel Debacker, Jean-Louis Vincent, and others, we recommended measurements of cardiac output and stroke volume to evaluate the response to fluids or inotropes in patients that are not responding to initial therapy. What about oliguria despite food challenges? Very simply, we have different causes of renal failure and oliguria. We have obstructive, obstructive causes of renal failure, macro secretory causes of renal failure, and organic cause of renal failure due to uh, uh, sepsis, to uh, drugs, or any other cause. In the first case, of course, we have to perform urinary tract ultrasonography to detect this situation and to, to think about surgery or some disobstruction. In case of macrosecretary cause or renal failure, we have two possibilities, either low calic output or low mean arterial pressure, the perfusion pressure for the kidney. In case of low calic output, of course, this could be due to hypovolemia again, and we have to test for the responsiveness in case of doubt. In this situation, we speak about oliguria in spite of three challenges, but nevertheless, we have to check again for the responsiveness and give uh, another feed balls uh, in case of a positive response in this situation for Liguria, of course, but it could be due to cardiac dysfunction and low cardiac output due to cardiac dysfunction. It is important to check cardiac function using echocardiography. And of course, to consider inotropes and for example, dobutamine in this situation. But, this also could be due to low mean atoll pressure. And we have to individualize the target MAP in patients in the ICU. And for example, we have to consider patients with prior hypertension and we can reach or we can target a higher MAP also in case of high CVP. Because you know, CVP is a downstream pressure for organ perfusion, for example, for the kidney. If you have a high CVP, you need to to increase the 
upstream pressure, the MAP. So we need to target a higher MAP in this situation. So it is important, as Jean-Louis Vincent said before, to personalize our uh, resuscitation and especially for the issue of mean atoll pressure. Of course, we have to consider a vasopressor in this situation. Regarding the organic cause of renal failure, we have to consider the renal replacement therapy in this situation, of course. And lastly, refractory hypotension. So what to do in the case of refractory hypotension? Just know that there is no consensual definition of refractory hypotension. For some experts, but not all experts, it is defined by inability of one microgram kilogram per minute norepinephrine to reach 65 with of memory mean total pressure. So I think that in this situation, we have first to recheck source control. Maybe sometimes the source of infection is not controlled, and this could be a reason for increasing the dose of norepinephrine and to speak about this uh, concept of refractory hypotension. Also, you have to retest preload responsiveness because uh, even if the patient was not preload responsive one or two hours before, uh, it could be uh, it could be preload responsive at the time you are thinking. And because preload responsiveness is uh, can change over time, so it is important instead of increasing again the dose of norepinephrine to retest preload responsiveness and to consider new fluid balance in case of positive test. And also it is important to recheck cardiac function using echocardiography because it could be a problem of uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, acute cardiomyopathy responsible for uh, this refractory hypotension. As you know, this can occur during sepsis uh, for, during over the first day, so you have to check and check again cardiac function using echo and consider a nine drop in this situation. But if not, you have to think about uh, a further increase in vasomotor tone. And for this, there are two possibilities. Either increasing the vasopressor load, and again, two possibilities, either further increasing the norepinephrine dose or adding another agent. Further increase in norepinephrine dose, is it dangerous? Could be dangerous, of course, because of the side effects of norepinephrine, but sometimes it could be helpful. This is a paper by the team of Bruno Levy from Nancy France, and they reported uh, that 40% of patients who received norepinephrine at a dose higher than one microgram per kilogram per minute, and sometimes far higher, were discharged alive from the ICU. So it's not criminal to increase the dose of norepinephrine above one microgram per kilogram per minute. But alternatively, you can add vasopressin. And Susanna Price uh, also spoke about uh, vasopressin and the interest of giving vasopressin to patients with shock. And this is a recommendation of the Sorbavig sepsis campaign guidelines and the recent ones uh, published uh, some years ago uh, recommend using norepinephrine as the first choice vasopressor, but suggested adding vasopressin to norepinephrine with the intent to raising MAP to target or to decrease the NF norepinephrine dosage in order to minimize the side effects of norepinephrine. And another possibility to increase vasomotor tone is to add steroids in order to, to have a synergy, a synerg synergic effect uh, on vasomotor tone. And this is also a suggestion of the surviving space campaign. They said, we suggest against using IV hydrocortisone to treat septic shock if adequate fluid resuscitation and vasopressor therapy are able to restore hemodynamic stability. But if this is not achievable, we suggest IV hydrocortisone at a dose of 200 milligrams per day. Of course, it is a weak recommendation with a low quality of evidence, but it is still 
a recommendation of the SSC guidelines. So, thank you very much for your attention. And Daniel, if you have some questions, uh, I will try to, to answer. So, thank you, Jean-Louis. Um, it was indeed a, a very nice um, um, guidance through these uh, troubleshootings of um, very difficult situations. Um, if I may begin with the um, atrial fibrillation, the new onset atrial fibrillation. Um, among the drugs, um, you didn't mention digoxin. Uh, is there still a place for digoxin in some patients or not? Uh, I didn't mention, of course. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I could have mentioned. Uh, we use less uh, digoxin in the ICU patients because of uh, uh, the easiness of using amiodarone, for example, and you know that the uh, therapeutic index of uh, digoxin is very narrow, uh, so this is why it's sometimes it, is, uh, it could be dangerous to use digoxin, and also the easiness and the simplicity of uh, giving amiodarone, and uh, this is why I did not mention. But it is still recommended in some recommendations in the, for example, the Open Society of Cardiology recommendations published uh, this year, uh, there is still a place for uh, digoxin in, uh, in this situation. And you mentioned several times... Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, if you use digoxin, it's not for uh, cardioversion. It is to hmm. reduce uh, heart rate. Yes, for rate control. And, uh, yeah. uh, but for the use of amiodarone, do you consider a central line or do you use also in the peripheral line? It is recommended to use a central line uh, to use amiodarone if you use the IV uh, route. Of course, uh, some uh, intensivists use oral uh, amiodarone, oral uh, amiodarone administration, loading dose of amiodarone. So, of course, if you use oral, the oral route, you, can, you, you don't need a central line. Of course. And regarding the refractory shock, um, you mentioned uh, some alternative drugs. Um, is there a role for um, angiotensin um, in, for treating uh, shock in our patients? You speak about uh, angiotensin. Refractory yeah. hypotension, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is not recommended by the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. This is why I did not mention, but of course, there are some uh, uh, data. Uh, recently published about the interest of using angiotensin uh, for patients who are refractory to, to norepinephrine. So maybe the, the good cocktail, the good cocktail could be the combination of norepinephrine, vasopressin, and angiotensin, but at relatively small doses in order to minimize the side effects of uh, each, uh, each drug. Maybe it is the future, I don't know. So, thank you very much for these uh, concluding remarks uh, on, on what is the future of vasopressor agents, because indeed uh, we still have a lot of questions there, but at least we know a lot already, and uh, you very nicely mentioned on how best we can use different alternatives um, to troubleshoot um, our patients in these conditions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Daniel.